Welcome to the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. The exhibition we want to show you today is Ambassador and Mrs. E.F. Drumwright's Ink Diplomacy, which celebrates the relationship between the Drumwrights and the Chinese people. As an ambassador to China from 1958 to 1962, Everett Drumwright had social access to the top political crowd, including President Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China in Taiwan. Among the upper echelon community, there are scholars and artists in Zhang's circle, which is typical in a Chinese community. Zhang's wife, Song Meiling, was an artist of Chinese painting. She had the best art teachers. Ambassador Drumwright's wife, Florence, was a journalist and artist who wanted to learn Chinese painting when she arrived in Taiwan. Mei Ling introduced her teachers to Florence. After that, the drum rights became part of the artist gatherings. The couple befriended many artists during their stay in Taiwan and collected many Chinese art. Before departure from Taiwan, they received more parting gifts in Chinese art. Returning in 1962, the couple settled in San Diego. They were very active in the Chinese community. After Ambassador Drumwright passed away in 1993, Florence donated a large portion of their collection to our museum. Many of these paintings were shown 60 years earlier when the Drumwrights organized an exhibit in Taiwan. Our current exhibition follows Drumwright's wishes to improve the understanding between peoples of different cultural backgrounds. Welcome to our gallery tour. I'm Lily Birmingham. Our exhibition has three groups. The first gallery showcases the gifts from the government officials. The second gallery has Drumwright's uh, teacher's paintings. And the third one are friends of drum rights. We'll start from here. The first one, this red paper, with a character, Ren, written by Chiang Kai-shek. Ren has two parts. The left is a person, the right is the number two. So it takes two people to have this virtue. Ren means benevolence, humane, and empathy which is a basic concept in the Confucianism and was ingrained in Chinese culture for a very long time. Confucianism was founded by Confucius around 2,500 years ago to promote an orderly society. So when Chiang Kai-shek wrote this, he is trying to improve his own virtue to reach this empathy so he could create an orderly uh, society. So when he was writing this, it's reinforcing this uh, virtue and also promote this to other people around him. During the time when John Wright was the ambassador from the United States, Chiang Kai-shek was in Taiwan. He was the president of the Republic of China. The reason is, after World War II, Mao Zedong led the Communist Party, defeated the government led by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek re retreated to Taiwan in 1949. Taiwan became the official China in the U.S. foreign policy. This situation lasted till 1978 when Nixon visited uh, China. So let's look at the character again how he wrote this standard script that you would normally see in a book. He will have to deliberately slowly start of each stroke and then end it with the corner so it has rounded the beginning and the end with a strength in between. So he studied and trained to write calligraphy very well. The skill of calligraphy was considered essential for a leader, so Chiang Kai-shek trained very well and practiced very well. So why did he use a red paper? Red is an aus auspicious color in Chinese culture. People usually use for celebration for uh, the Chinese New Year's or weddings. 
So he chose this color for a very good reason. So now we have seen the calligraphy by Zhang Kaixie. Now let's look at painting by his wife, Song Meiling. This is a typical Chinese painting with moving perspective, which means we're like the bird flying over this ridge and see different vintage points of the scene. So let's start from the top. We see this very rugged mountain, tall with steep slopes. It looks like something very hard to climb. And, um, but you do see some clouds floating around, creates this uh, mystic sense. And you see some buildings on the right. This is a village. And the left, there are a couple of buildings there tucked away in this mountain. This is a idealized place for one to cultivate one's virtue. But if you continue looking down, we get closer to the bottom. There's more clarity of this painting and the pine trees become bigger and darker because they're closer to us. You can see the leaves and the tree trunks, they're all painted with great detail. The terrain is very rugged, you can see the ground. So, Song Meiling painted this with a lot of confidence in her brush strokes. She used heavy, medium, light touches to express different parts of this painting. And the color overall is muted. It's dark green, gray, brown. It gives a sense of a lonely wilderness. It will be a tough mountain to climb. She signed her name on the middle left, Mei Ling, with a seal. So Mei Ling was a modern woman. She was educated in the United States. She was a good translator and diplomat. During World War II, as the first lady from the Republic of China, she came to the United States to give passionate speeches to the Congress. As a result, she won American support for China. And she was on the Time magazine three times on the cover. So she was pretty amazing. Let's look at the top. Let's go back to the top. Look at the calligraphy. Her husband, Chiang Kai-shek, wrote the calligraphy. It says, my wife's painting is vigorous and robust. It reminds me the central mountain peak in my childhood in Zhejiang province. I feel sentimental as I commemorate my late mother's 103rd birthday. Signed, Rei Yuan, which was Chiang Kai-shek's childhood name. It was common for Chinese art with more than one person collaborating. So this is a husband and wife uh, collaboration. I would like you to take a look of this painting again. Look at the overall composition, the ruggedness of the, the mountain, the muted color, because we're going to look at it again later. But for now, I want to show you a couple of horses coming out of the paper painted by Chiang Kai-shek's general. Look at the two horses here. They're running along happily, checking with each other. They're almost coming out of the paper here. They're galloping. I want you to take a closer look of the way the legs, the hooves, and the faces are painted. The lines are not connected. There are lots of gaps. Those gaps are for our eyes to make the connection. So less is more. And then look again, look at the curving fast brushworks on the hair of the necks and the tail of the horses. The brushes are semi-dry, so you see some white as the brush moves. It gives a sense that there's so much wind blowing on the horses because they're running very fast. And then look at the tonal variation of the colors. One horse seems to be darker than the other, but within each horse, 
there is enough variation of the color to make you feel like there is a volume of the body. The form is very dynamic. The horses are almost off the ground. They're galloping along. This was painted by Ye Zui Bai, who graduated from the Huangpu Military Academy and served as a major general under Chiang Kai-shek. He retired at age 60 and started to paint horses. Because his long career in the military, he has such a strong bond with horses, he could paint horses from his memory. He painted this pair of horses as a parting gift for the drum rights. He wrote on the upper left, this is a gift to China's best friends, Mr. and Mrs. Drumwright, painted by Ye Zuibai in 1962. Later that year, Drumwright left Taiwan. So this was a gift with a lot of sentiments. Ye Zuibai's comment about Drumwright being China's best friends is also the essence of this exhibition. We want to celebrate drum rights relationship with the Chinese people. Now we're going to leave this very dynamic painting to a great detail, court style landscape behind you. Look at this beautiful landscape with a, a lot of detail, a lot of color. This is the court style or gongbi of landscape. Every line, every brushstroke is placed exquisitely and carefully with a lot of uh, time devoting to this, to paint something like this. We'll start from the top again. Uh, if you look at the top, there's not a lot of detail and there's also more moisture, more clouds, more smoky scents, and there are trees. It feels like it's far away. There are layers of mountains and that is very far away. And notice the waterfalls going from the top right, going down toward a little left, heading toward a canyon. And notice there's a person sitting on the mountain on the left. He is appreciating the beauty of this nature. He's probably a Taoist. Taoism was founded by Lao Tzu over 2,500 years ago. The core belief is that we should embrace nature, never go against the flow, because flexibility is strength. As you continue looking down, the clarity improves in this painting, and you keep going down, there's more and more uh, detail of the trees. The colors are darker. There are actually layers of pine needles in this uh, foreground. And uh, if you keep moving down, eventually we see the waterfalls have become a gushing river. This is a spring-like uh, landscape, especially the colors, this turquoise blue really brightens the entire painting. This was painted by Qi Da Kui, who was a rare individual during the 20th century, who was still painting very time-consuming detailed paintings. He was an eccentric person, so there are not many of his paintings uh, available. For us to have one, this is quite a treat. I want to compare this painting with the one we saw earlier by Song Meiling. This one on the top, there's a lot more layers and more smoky feeling, so it's a much deeper mountain. But if you look at the brushwork, the uh, Song Meiling's brushwork was very steady, robust. It gives us a sense it's a much tougher terrain than this one. And both have a lot of pine trees in the foreground. Pine trees symbolize longevity, so it's very common in Chinese painting, especially as gifts to the drum rites. It may also symbolize everlasting friendship. 
The story behind this gift or this painting is written in a calligraphy on the left of this painting. It's actually written by Shen Changhuan. Shen Changhuan was the Minister of Foreign Affairs under Chiang Kai-shek. During the time John Rai was the ambassador, they interacted with each other a lot. So Shen Changhuan wrote in this uh, stationery that my brother ever a drum right, I would like to give you this as a gift because I think the, the green blue mountain and gushing river simulating spring could bless you and your, your wife for a blessing year. It would be my pleasure if you could uh, keep it as a gift. And it was signed by him 1962. So later that year, drum rights left Taiwan for good. And it was uh, very special for Shen Chuan to give his own collection. He said, this was from my own collection and I'm willing to give you as a gift. He wrote it on his own stationery, so it appears to be a casual note, but the gift was pretty um, sincere. So we have looked at several paintings as gifts to the drum rights from the government officials. Now we're ready to go to the next gallery to look at the works by Florence's teachers. Look at this very simple composition of bamboo, mums, and the rock. It's so simple, but if you look closely, every brush has strength, almost like there's steel in there. Look at the leaves and branches of the bamboo. There's so much energy and power connecting to this stalk. The stalk has simple gradation of color, give you the roundness of the cylinder of this uh, stalk. And then if you look down, look at the rock. It's almost like an abstract art with all kinds of texture. If you look on the left, the chrysanthemum flowers are coming out with life. And then continue to the left, you see the fence is trying to hang on to there. So the calligraphical skill for this painting is superb. You can probably guess it was painted by Zhang Daqian. Zhang Daqian was the most famous Chinese artist during the 20th century. He lived till 83 years old. He lived in many places such as China, Taiwan, Brazil, and California. He traveled a lot. The story goes, he met Picasso. The two of them got together, talked about painting techniques. It was truly the giants of East meets West. So Zhang Daqian painted things with a lot of fun. And he also wrote a poem, actually he, he copied the poem that has the humor there. So the poem came from Zheng Ban Qiao from the 17th century. So Zhang Daqian copied it. The fence was placed there to protect the mums, but then the old bamboo grew so many shoots as they surrounded the mums. So the poem, the poem continues. <laughs> the ancient scholar Tao Yuanming loved mums, and um, Wang Ziyou loved bamboo. But eventually, they became a family. So what happened was, one guy's sister married the other guy. So they were happily together as one family, as the bamboos and chrysanthemums are surrounding each other. They're happily together. So it was a cute poem. Zhang Daqian often referred to it when he painted the bamboo and mums. And he continued to write, this was for Florence to keep as a souvenir. He painted in 1976. Zhang Daqian taught 
Song Meilin painting, and probably also saw Paul Todd uh, Florence. So the gift was for Florence to keep, and this was in 1976, many years after John Wright left China or left Taiwan in 1962. So it means the John Wrights kept friendship with their Chinese friends for a very long time. So Zhang Daqian was a great teacher. One of Zhang Daqian's friends taught Florence landscape painting. So let's look at that one next. Look at this beautiful landscape with a vast land in front of us. I want to get your attention to the red color. Look at the mountain, especially on the upper left. There's red reflection of the sunset. And if you follow that down through the clouds, you see the red reflection of the ground also reflecting the sunset. And, and if you follow the river, keep going all the way to the foreground on the right, you see these deep red leaves. The entire camp, camp painting has this um, warm, unassuming red color to make this whole composition with a harmony and comfortable feeling. If you thought this might look like a Western painting, you would be right, because this artist, Huang Junbi, was known to paint fusion of Western painting and the Chinese painting. He was a teacher in China for several art schools. After 1949, he became the dean of the art department in the National Taiwan Normal University. So he was a great teacher. Song Meilin admired his uh, painting for landscape, invited him over to become her tutor. And he also taught Florence, as I mentioned earlier. The title of this painting is called uh, Watching Sailboat Returning from Afar. So there are sailboats, especially in the foreground left, you see just a few brush strokes, the artist defined the silhouette. You can imagine people returning from sailing in the uh, sunset. They could just uh, walk up the land, go up the hill, cross the little bridge, and probably meet with their family. So the whole painting has a very tranquil mood. The feeling is very comfortable. And um, Huang Junbi is really known for painting uh, this type of uh, landscape. So on the upper left, you see the uh, calligraphy. He is giving this to Mr. and Mrs. Drumwright as a gift. He painted this at uh, American International University, which is today the Alliant International University in Swift Ranch, uh, San Diego. So Huang Junbi was visiting the Drumwrights in San Diego and painted this in 1977. Again, it demonstrates that the drum rights were keeping their Chinese friends decades after return to the uh, America. So I have shown you two drum, uh, Florence teachers who are males, but Florence also had female teachers. So let's find out. Look at this beautiful wisteria. It was painted by Shao Youxuan, who was known to paint birds and flowers and was Florence's teacher. Look at the composition, this diagonal line with crisscross vines creates the dynamic uh, movement. Everything looks like it's blowing in the wind, especially the leaves and flowers, they are layered with confidence of this brushwork, they look like floating freely. But the vines, the vines twist and turn with determination of the brushwork. These are the technique of a master. So Shao Youxuan was educated in Beijing Art School. And then after she went to Taiwan, she was an art teacher. 
Her father was also a famous、um, painter. She studied from masters such as、uh, Zhang Daqian and Qi Bai Shi. From those masters, she learned how to use the powerful brushwork. But she also observed nature for her painting. If you look at the wisteria flower, the blossom here, notice the base are fully blooming blossoms, but the tip are still buds. That's the way wisteria bloom in nature. So she really watched how nature flowers behave and combine with her. Calligraphical skill to paint these works. That's why she was a master in flower painting. When you enjoy the color here, look at the violet, the blue, all these color transition. There's a lot of、uh, Western art influence. So she also took into Western art technique to combine with her Chinese.、Uh, Capability to combine these type of、uh, very dynamic uh, movement. Uh, so her painting has the elegance and grace in this seemingly chaotic world. So it's all in the technique. Anything simple through the master's hands could be masterful and just very enjoyable. So she was、um, Florence's teacher. Florence was lucky to have many teachers. Florence also had many artist friends. So in our next gallery, you will see some drum rights friends paintings presented by Linda Di Benedetto. I am Linda Di Benedetto, and this gallery contains works of art. From some of the leading modern Chinese artists who were friends of Mrs. Drumright, we're going to explore how those artists embraced modern art and at the same time maintained reverence for uh, Chinese uh, historical landscapes. We'll start with a scene from 10th century. Look at this beautiful woman. She's、uh, confident and、uh, dressed richly, and in fabrics that are exquisitely detailed. Can you see the fabulous jade hairpin and the cloth that's knotted and twisted to help maintain her elaborate hairdo? Now let's explore the rest of the figure. Focus for a moment on the midsection. And notice that very exquisite pattern there. All the fine little lines that are used to create it. Now moving further down, you see areas of of stark contrast. There is white next to very dark black. And moving all the way down, you get a sense of movement by the way her robe drapes out behind her in repetitive waves. And if you look closely, you can see that those folds are created by just a simple white line and fine black line next to it. The only color you see in this work is the bright red that accents her lips and draws attention to her face. And then the red from that ribbon-like sash leads us down her body and. Right down to the bottom, where a little bit of red is peeping out underneath it. That red sash also mirrors her very correct vertical posture. It's only broken by a slight bow of her head. Now that you've looked at some of the details of this work, you、um, might have thought that it was a painting, but it's actually a tapestry. And、um, it was made by the National History Museum of the Republic of China, or actually produced by them, but made by the Chinese fabric company, synthetic fabric company, in the 20th century. The art of embroidery on tapestry comes from ancient China, and it was called kesi. Which has become a, a national cultural heritage. 
Kesi means cut silk because it uh, gives the illusion of cut threads, which create texture that you could see in her hair. The earliest sample we have of, of Kesi is from the Tang Dynasty. And if you read the inscription by Fu Xin Yu, he tells us that, that this was uh, inspired by a painting from a 10th century painter in, from the Southern Song, or Tang Dynasty. Fu Xin Yu was a, a very fine painter in his own right. He was the um, cousin of the last Qing emperor, and he was coupled with Cheng Dai Qin, who you saw earlier, and um, they were each best in their area. So they were known as South Cheng and North Fu. When they added a third artist, Wen Zhongbi, they were known as the three masters who crossed the sea because they all uh, relocated from mainland China to Taiwan in 1949. This beautiful tapestry was given as a gift to Mrs. Drumright by Fu Xin Yu. Now we're going to leave this um, glimpse at the 10th century court life in China for a glimpse into 20th century nature. This painting by Gao Yi Hong is titled Orchid and Mushroom. Can you see how the flower stems and the leaves curve gracefully over the top of the mushrooms? And they're made with lines that uh, mirror the shape of the mushrooms. There's an old Chinese saying that says, in order to be excellent at calligraphy, you must be able to paint orchids and bamboos well. And excellent calligraphy is thought to contain the fragrance of orchids. Why do you think he painted this, compared the orchids with mushrooms in this painting? Well, that goes back to Chinese symbolism. The mushrooms are a symbol for a long life. And when he puts the orchids and the mushrooms together, He's creating best wishes for a long life for the drum rites. Now I want to draw your attention to the top of the calligraphy. And on the right, that very first character is the character for nine, the number nine, and which is very important in Chinese culture. The number, in Chinese like to uh, engage in wordplay. So the word for nine, sounds very much like the word for abundance. So when you put, now when Gao puts nine together with the orchid and the mushroom, he is giving them eternal blessings, good, good wishes. Now that same character for number nine, you can see at the top of the calligraphy on the next painting. You can count nine fish in this painting. The Chinese word for fish is a homophone for abundance. So what do you get when you put the, the nine and the fish together? The inscription says that this is a, a best wishes express, expression for the drum rights, for Mr. Drumright and his wife Florence's enjoyment, and it's dated 1978. Look how he's added a little bit of red to this painting to add interest and also to show that goldfish come in different colors. See how they, how they flow gently from the upper right corner down to the bottom left. And the fish on the top look further away because they're smaller than the ones on the bottom. He creates motion by putting all kinds of angles into the fins and tails and by modulating the color between light and dark. This is very difficult to do with brush and ink painting. 
You can lighten the color by adding water, but you need to control the movement and control the power on the brush to create the lovely effect you see here in these fish who look happy and content. Not all artists continued with brush and ink painting in the 20th century. Shi De Qin was one of the first artists in Taiwan to use oil paints, which he used to paint a very vivid portrait of Mrs. Drumright. Look at those engaging eyes. They give us a sense of vivaciousness and intelligence. Florence's uh, elegant style, her, her wisdom, and her character were eternalized in this portrait that was painted in 1961 by Shi Dechin. He um, was uh, influenced by um, um, abstract expressionism, which was a movement that started in New York City and involved uh, expressive abstract forms that would evoke emotion in the viewer. Here he, here he is gone back to a more figurative style, but you can see the Western influence in the thick, thick of, of brush strokes, which are very expressive. He most likely painted this when he was uh, here for a joint exhibition of Chinese artists that was sponsored by the U.S. Department of um, Information. And look, look at the, the background. It's an explosion of color. And, but it doesn't overpower the figure, which is outlined in heavy black lines. Also, that um, intense gaze and her bright, shiny blonde hair draw the focus on her. There are abstract modeled colors in her dress, but they still retain the dignity that matches her persona. Shi Dei Qin was a very respected and prolific artist, wrote many books, and he was invited to come to the United States to study by the State Department. And then in 1963, he had a solo exhibition in Washington, D.C. After that, he went to Paris, where he lived and painted for several years, until he returned to Taiwan and became um, for to take a position as an, a professor of art in the National Taiwan Normal University. This portrait looks very personal, which suggests that uh, he made this portrait uh, just as a gift for Florence. Color plays a very important role in this painting. Now let's see how another artist uses color in a more traditional brush and ink landscape. In this early 80s landscape by O Hao Nian, can you see how he's used different brush strokes and abrupt squiggles? to create texture that contrasts with the soft sheets of color pastel washes. He wants you, the viewer, to get a poetic impression of the landscape rather than a lot of minute details. And he's able to show the harmony in nature by playing with delicate patterns and balancing the light and, and light and shadow. You can see many of the characteristics of traditional Chinese landscapes in this modern painting. For example, there are always mountains, rocks, trees, and water, and man is almost always present in the landscape. Can you find people in this scene? Let me direct your eye down to the bottom, just left of center. And this small figure is a man sitting on a rock 
with a hat on and he's got a fishing pole fishing in the string. This is a very common subject in traditional uh, Chinese landscapes. O worked in the Lingnan school style and Lingnan means south of the mountains. It's referring to uh, an area in China which includes Guangdong province, Hong Kong, and Macau. Artists who worked there were uh, had exposed to diverse cultures and also had an expanded market for their work because of the busy maritime trade. The Lingnan School became both politically and artistically important in the 20th century. They wanted to be recognized as the new national style of painting for China. Artists, uh, Lingnan artists like Hon Yen, were known for their eclectic style that combined Western and Chinese art. O oh said that in order to understand nature, he had to first go out into nature and study it and then sketch it, bring the sketches back to his studio where he reorganized it and created the final composition using his imagination. This follows the Lingnan philosophy, which says, use nature as teacher, but use your own intelligence. So what he's doing is he's giving you the impression of what it felt like to be there. He's not giving minute details. He traveled the world to paint uh, in, out in nature, climbing up into mountains, even into his 80s. We don't exactly know the location of this, but it looks similar to some other paintings that he made in the Taroko Gorge area uh, in Taiwan. And in the 80s, he made several trips there to sketch. Pine trees are also one of his passions. But notice how he uses a very abrupt Western abstracted way of painting the pine trees because he wants, again, he wants to express the essence of the tree, not the, not the realistic details. And in this painting, you can see that the water played a small but significant part. What if water dominates the entire scene? Just look at the rush of water tumbling over the crest and of the waterfall and cascading over the rocks down to form this wide diagonal near the bottom. This is a complex waterfall with many paths coming down the mountain. This was painted by two artists you've already, already heard of, Cheng Daichin and Wang Junbi. Wun Zhongbi was known for waterfalls. He painted all over the world when he was 74. He traveled to paint the um, Niagara Falls in the United States, Iguazu Falls in Argentina, and Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. And he developed, they, they, People called his falls flying falls. Can you see why they're called flying? His vigorous slashing brush strokes have water going everywhere. Even the pine trees are dramatic as they bend this way and that. And look how he's painted them using just very abstract forms. This was probably painted in um, 1976 when both artists were here in San Diego visiting with their friend and former student, Mrs. Drumright. This, um, this practice of collaboration between artists and getting together and sharing ideas comes from the literati uh, tradition in Chinese art. The literati were wealthy scholars who spent a lot of time out in nature 
meditating, writing poetry, and painting. And then they, they often added something to a friend's painting. Now, I talked about all the rushing water and everything. The only quiet spot in this painting is that little man that has hiked up this trail on the right and is, on, try, is trying to get to the crest of the waterfall. That is the only part, that figure and the calligraphy are the only two parts that uh, Chung Dai Chen painted on this painting. And in the literati tradition of adding something to a friend's painting, which they often documented by putting their seal on the painting and adding some calligraphy, which Chung has done right over here. So now we're going to conclude our tour by looking at a small photo gallery. Let me direct your attention to this uh, photo number two. You remember that portrait? Of course, that's Florence Drumright. And this is Florence standing next to it. And next to her is Agnes Chuang, who was the wife of a previous director of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. Florence must have really liked that portrait because she kept it in her bedroom until she gave it to her friend Agnes, and here it is in the Chong home. Now, if you look down below that, at photo number four, you can see Ambassador Drumright and Florence in the Chong home celebrating his 85th birthday in 1991. Now, coming over here, to these photos on the upper right. They're just capturing various uh, casual meetings that the drum rights had with people that were um, associated with the museum. But I want to direct your attention down here to the bottom right to photo number 12. This was taken in 1996 and it documents the ceremony for the opening of the uh, of this museum and we can see Florence Drumright attended that it was very important at it on the end and some of the dignitaries from the museum and second from the left is Mayor Susan Golding the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum is grateful to the Drumrights for their generous gift of these magnificent examples of Chinese art given to them by government officials, teachers, and friends. The paintings are a celebration of friendship between the drum rights and the Chinese community. The exhibit fulfills Ambassador and Mrs. Drumright's wishes to improve understanding between people of different cultural backgrounds. Thank you for joining us on our tour.